So welcome everybody for joining us today on behalf of the Alliance of Democracies Foundation and its Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity. My name is Olaf Bönke and I am the Senior Advisor to the Transatlantic Commission and it's my pleasure to um, have you here for a, a very interesting and promise, what's promising and interesting conversation about the US midterm elections. Let me give you a quick hands up of who the TCI, the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity is. It was founded as a reaction to the US presidential elections in 2016 in the year 2018. And since then the commission has raised awareness about the global threat of election interference to democracies around the world and is advocating for a determined response from governments, uh, parliaments, tech industry, media and civil society to work together to make our democracies digitally more resilient against their adversar adversaries at home and abroad. So with that discussion today, we are returning in a way back to our origin and uh, we want to take stock what has happened in the mid um, terms last week and what it tells us also about our learning curves as democracies in the last six years. The talk today will be led by our TCI member and internationally loan journalist Jean Reserve. And before I give the floor to Jean, two uh, of our obligatory announcements. This event is on the record, as you have seen, and please use the Q&A chat or the comment function in your social media um, stream you're watching if you would like to ask a question or make a comment. And without further ado, I give the floor to Jean and looking forward to that conversation. Olaf, thank you so much. The US midterm election isn't quite over yet, but I think we can say if we look at this through a democracy lens rather than a partisan political lens, uh, things have gone pretty well, few. Um, some of the big issues that might have threatened the integrity of the election have in fact not come to pass. Uh, there are lessons to be learned, however, about what did go right and what did not. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. Two of them are members of the Transatlantic Commission uh, on Election Integrity. Secretary Chertoff is a member of the Board of Freedom House. He is co-founder and chairman of the Chertoff Group and, of course, a former secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Natalie Juresco was director of Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico. She is also the former finance minister for Ukraine. Um, also with us today, the founder and CEO of Anchor Change, former public policy director at Facebook and director of technology and democracy at the International Republican Institute, a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council and a fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center, Katie Harbath. Also with us, Chris Krebs, founding partner of the Krebs Stanos Group and chair of the Commission on Information Disorder at the Aspen Institute. He was previously the first director of the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, known as CISA. He is also newly he is also newly sanctioned by the Russian government. And also with us is Linda Chavez, a member of the board of the Renew Democracy Initiative. She's a senior fellow at the National Immigration Forum. And in 1985, she ran for the U.S. Senate from the state of Maryland. Great to have you all with us here today. Uh, before we begin our discussion, a reminder, we do want your questions and comments. If they're brief, you can submit them on the Q&A function here on Zoom. Um, so the TCEI has spent a lot of its time looking at the question of foreign interference. So first, an update on that. Um, Natalie, uh, last election, the Russians were the big players. We haven't read as much about that this time around. Does that mean they weren't active? No, I think they were, but I think they are active in a different way than they were in our previous elections. And I think we no longer have to surmise because they're admitting it publicly. Uh, Yevgeny uh, Prigozhin, who has been related to something called the <clears throat> Internet Research Agency in Russia, previously accused of interfering with elections, stated publicly, we have interfered, we are interfering, and we will interfere. And he intimated that they're doing it differently now, more surgically, I quote. He said that we could remove both your kidneys and liver at once. And I think what that means is they're not using the larger social networks anymore. They're not using the Facebooks as much because Facebook and Meta have figured out how to, in essence, uh, control it. But instead, they're using more subtle campaigns, campaigns through 
Telegram and other messaging units, other uh, social networks that are smaller like Gab, where freedom of speech is more, um, more, more, uh, more of the principle behind the operations. And I think all of it continues in a way to distort our political system, but also to build lack of confidence in our institutions. So I think it continues, although it may not be as visible as it was before. And Natalie, given your former position as finance minister of Ukraine, I'm curious if the war in Ukraine uh, has been a, a part of their strategy here. I think indeed it has. Instead of just focusing on undermining trust in our electoral system, this time the messaging was very clearly undermining the Biden administration, the U.S. position on Ukraine, on whether or not it was valuable to continue supporting Ukraine militarily, financially, and trying to undermine Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's position within the American electorate, and supporting those candidates who were against continuing support for Ukraine. Uh, Michael, has China become a bigger player when it comes to foreign election interference? <clears throat> uh, yes, they have, uh, Gene. But before we get to China, I just want to add one thing on Russia, which I thought was interesting. Uh, Putin gave a speech a couple of weeks ago. And in the speech, he talked about how he didn't have any problem with many Americans because, like many Americans, he's a supporter of Christian nationalism and, you know, values that reject uh, you know, LGBTQ, et cetera. But his problem is with the elites in the United States. And I thought this was a kind of an overt play to develop sympathy among a certain segment of the electorate and the political uh, body on the issue of are they be all in on backing Ukraine or are they going to start backing away from that? So that's not concealed. I mean, it came out of Putin's mouth, but I thought the agenda was clear. As to your question, uh, China has become a bigger player in the election element. China has done disinformation operations before. Typically, they've been focused on elevating China's stature with a target audience and also denigrating democracy in quotes in general, talking about how democracy uh, as it's practiced in the West is not efficient. They don't produce results in China because of the way they, their government works they're able to produce good results for everybody. In the last year, China moved much more into the model that we had seen the Russians use, which is to use uh, social media to um, covertly promote both the right and the left in the run-up to the election, trying to stir up both sides to be uh, more uh, energetic and more excited about fighting each other. So on the side of the right, you know, they were attacking issues that are typically, you know, election fraud, things of that sort. On the left, they were saying, oh, the Democrats, uh, I'm sorry, on, on, the, on the right, they were complaining about gun control and things of that sort. On the left, they were telling the Democrats, oh, if the Republicans get in charge, everybody's going to have guns. So it was much more like what we had seen in the case of Russia back in 2016. Um, Michael, let me ask, also ask you about Iran. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, there were letters that went out to some voters in Florida, I believe, purportedly from the Proud Boys, and those were eventually attributed to Iran. Um, have they been um, active as well? Iran's been active. They tend to be much more focused on the JTC POA and making sure that there is uh, support for candidates who they view as left-wing and likely to support an agreement with Iran, as opposed to politicians that they view as antagonistic to Iran. So they did play a role as well in this election, but it was instead of doing what the Chinese did, which was to amplify on both sides in order to create just general dissension, here it was much more targeted to promoting those candidates whom they surmised would be more sympathetic. Um, Katie, I'm wondering what you think of the social media platforms handling of these efforts at uh, foreign interference. Did they do well or not? Yeah, and I'll be curious to hear Chris's thoughts on this on this too. But I think that we definitely saw um, your your bigger platforms, your Facebooks, um, your Twitters, your Googles finding these things a lot sooner um, to take them down. The networks seem to be to be somewhat smaller um, <clears throat> in some of these cases. And so, um, and what we some of the trends that we've been hearing in stories is that that activity has moved to other platforms, as as Natalie mentioned. 
And, and I think that, you know, I found it interesting, though not surprising, TikTok does not talk at all about how they handle foreign interference um, on their on their platform. Um, a lot of it did move to your to your gabs and your parlors. Um, and part of my, my concern with the midterms and as we go into 2024 is how more decentralized the online environment has gotten. And there are many more areas for, for these actors to try to exploit loopholes in all of these different types of, of platforms and systems. Um, but but the big the big folks did um, pretty well. Uh, Chris, do you share that assessment? I do. And I think it's primarily uh, a factor of the actors themselves, the Russians, the Chinese and others uh, diversifying their approach. If you actually look at some of the data sets that were provided by Facebook and Twitter and others or Meta, sorry, still haven't quite made that leap yet. Uh, if you look at the data sets, you'll see that the engagement is, is quite low. Um, I, so what, what that tells me is they're, they're, looking, they're looking elsewhere, pink slime, online journals, they're actually supporting uh, individuals and, and boosting them. Um, I, I would also step back a little bit and, you know, Natalie, to your point about Prigozhin's comments, I mean, I, I, I looked at that and said that in and of itself is an information operation. That is Prigozhin putting himself out there, reminding the Kremlin of the good work, the good work he's been doing, and that, you know, he needs, uh, whether it's Wagner or through the Internet Research Agency, that, that he's supportive of, uh, of the Kremlin. And so they need to keep that in mind and probably pay him a little bit better. Um, so I think, you know, down the, down the road where this is going, I would look at what just happened up in Canada with, the, uh, with the, the Canadian intelligence services calling out the Chinese efforts to actually buy members of parliament. They actually have financial influence over specific members of parliament and whether the Canadians are the first to find it, uh, you know, first, we know that happens at the local level here in the United States. So it's not just about the social media platforms, the way the Chinese operate, it's much more savvy. It's much more subtle. It's much more bottom up and kind of a grassroots approach. And I think that's where probably the bulk of their investments are gonna to be today and in the future. Um, Chris, there were some denial of service attacks against uh, election systems. I know the Russians took credit, at least for the one in Mississippi. Um, what can you tell us about that and who might be responsible? Well, I, it's it's a little unclear. It looks like it's KillNet though, uh, which is a, a hacktivist or at least a, a group that's affiliated or, or sympathetic to the Kremlin and the efforts. Uh, of their invasion or their special operations in the in the Ukraine, uh, th it just reinforces the need for basic cybersecurity hygiene, uh, including DDoS protections across state and local governments. And, and I think this is an opportunity for CISA and some and other federal government resources to provide that sort of assistance. Uh, but but these are you know these are low level. These don't impact the actual machinery of elections. A denial of service attack against the Secretary of State website on election day. At best, it could prevent a, uh, a citizen from seeing what the unofficial results are. But of course, it does not touch any of the voting process, the counting, uh, and the official certification process. So it's a nuisance. But to be very clear, what I believe, and I think this is in a, you know not necessarily a unique opinion to, to just me, it's that we see adversaries across the board that are not just looking for technical effects, they're looking for psychological effects. And when it, with a combined information operation, it's not just about disrupting a system, it's about disrupting the psychology of the electorate around the issue and using their unfamiliarity with the process to drive fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But looking, Chris, at the technical side itself, things seem to have stood up well. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, CISA and the FBI were quite, uh, you know, actually for, more forward leaning than I was in 2020, saying that, you know, we're not aware of anything. Uh, we're not aware of any capabilities of these actors to disrupt voting, uh, the counting or the actually, you know, the ability to cast a, a vote. And that's a consistent opinion I've had for quite some time. Um, now, it is important, though, to distinguish between an adversary's capability and, and you know, tech, technical issues and glitches that happen through the administration of elections. I think the great example there is Maricopa County and the paperweight and printing issue that led to some of the rejection of the tabulators. Now, noting that the election process itself is actually incredibly resilient. There's a concept known as software independence where uh, through the election process, that technology, whether software or hardware, 
cannot be a single point of failure. And what I've likened it to is it's, it's a voting is kind of like an escalator. If it breaks, it just turns into stairs. You still get where you're trying to go. It just takes a little bit more effort. And that's really the resilience mindset that happens in American elections. Um, Linda, looking at disinformation on the domestic side as opposed to the foreign side, what's your assessment of uh, how things went? Well, you know, it was, I think, a very good day for democracy uh, in America this uh, this last week. Um, we did not see the kind of activity that we saw in 2020. Yes, there were protesters. Yes, there were few people in places like Maricopa County in Arizona and elsewhere that showed up uh, at the drop boxes and camouflage with guns uh, attempting to intimidate, but it wasn't as broad scale. And during this long count, and it has been very long count, as we speak, there still is no declared winner for the governor's race in the state of Arizona. And there are a whole number of seats that have not been decided in the state of California. But we haven't seen the massing of people outside the counting centers. We have not seen the kind of threatening language. And most importantly, many of the most ardent election deniers, those who denied the uh, 2020 election, who ran for office for things like secretary of state or governor, ended up being defeated. And some of them have actually even conceded their election. I mean, Doug Mastio, who was a very far right candidate running for governor of Pennsylvania, took him a while, took him several days, but he finally actually conceded that he had lost that election. And even in those places where we haven't yet uh, seen a uh, conciliatory conceding speech, we do have a sense that people are accepting the results of the election. And that is such a difference from what happened in 2020. So, you know, uh, President Biden gave a speech on the importance. A lot of pundits, including this one, uh, sort of poo pooed this as, gee, is that really the message you want to go into this election in when you're way behind? Well, it turns out a lot of Americans care about democracy. And I think it actually was a very good message. So if I can, I think it's, oh, sorry, Gina, I was just going to say, I think it's also important to note that that's also what we've seen happen in Brazil. Um, yeah. Brazil has also had elections that has been during all of this. And so um, while I do worry about, I know we'll get to what this all means for 2024, um, I just wanted to chime in with that as well. Sure. Bolsonaro, you know, he lost and such is life. So a couple of things are going to happen in the next couple of days. One, we're going to find out what happened in that Arizona race. And as we know, Carrie Lake, who is the Republican candidate, has been pretty outspoken in the past about what she see sees as deficiencies uh, in the electoral system. So she may say more. And of course, uh, we may see President Trump choosing to enter the race uh, as soon as this week. Um, do any of you have thoughts on how rhetoric from the two of those may change this conversation. Michael, do you want to take that first? Yeah, let me start by saying, I mean, I don't know what Lake is going to do. Obviously, going into this, she refused to acknowledge that she would abide by the result. But as, as Linda just said, you had a number of people who were ardent deniers who have not only lost, but conceded and didn't play the game of denial. So that, that suggests that Maybe the rhetoric going in doesn't necessarily predict the rhetoric going out. Now, could she request a recount? She might. And, uh, you know, that's frankly not unheard of. And as long as she agrees to accept the result of that, that would be fine. Now, what, what is Donald Trump going to do? I mean, that's anybody's guess. Trying to imagine what's going on in his head is kind of a nightmare. Um, I think he's going to double down on his rhetoric because I don't think flexibility or nimbleness is a characteristic one associates with him. But I do think one of the takeaways from this election is, in many ways, his embrace is the kiss of death from a political standpoint. So what he may wind up doing, the more uh, extreme he gets, is driving away more and more of the Republicans who up to now have been willing to at least stand with him. Um, as was mentioned, a lot of election deniers did not win statewide office, but I believe more than half of the Republicans in Congress are people who have questioned uh, the results of 2020. Um, what could that portend? Linda? 
Well, first of all, I think you have to understand that a lot of those members of Congress are mouthing what they think will help them with the base and they wanna keep their jobs. The single most important thing to those members is that they keep getting reelected. And they did not want Donald Trump amassing uh, support or perhaps launching somebody as a primary challenger. So I take a bit with a grain of salt, uh, the Elise Stefanics and some of the others who you know, said all of these election denying things. However, the very, very uh, tight numbers in the House, I, if again, if I were a betting person, uh, I would bet that the Republicans are going to end up with a very tiny lead in the House of Representatives. And that is going to be a huge headache for Kevin McCarthy, or if he's challenged successfully, I don't think he will be, but if he is, um, that will be a, a huge headache. And the question is, what kind of impact is it going to have on important issues? Well, one of the most important issues, and I hope that it is settled in this lame duck session, is the Electoral Count Act, because this has the opportunity of being able to fix some of the problems going into the next presidential election about how elections are challenged once the counting of the votes occurs uh, in the joint session of Congress that meets uh, after the Electoral College. So that's gonna be something to look to. I could jump in, Jeannie, real quick, just on the point that Linda made about um, Stefanik and others kind of playing footsie with election, denial, election denialism just to you know, primarily get through their primary and then make sure that they don't have Trump coming out against them is while they may secretly or privately not believe any of these things, their constant messaging is resetting entirely the permission structure within the Republican party, principally across the base that is now being led to believe these things. And so it is ultimately corrosive to democracy and it sets us up for I think a longer term disruption, and you're seeing it right now, right? You're seeing these narratives emerge about how is it that all of a sudden it takes so long to count votes? Well, you know, it's always been that way. How is it that uh, we now have made this massive shift to mail-in voting? Well, I'll tell you what, at the beginning of, of the United States of America, vo voting happened across multiple days. It wasn't until about 1845 that you try that they tried to get it consolidated down to day to one day, but then it expanded again through civil war, through the civil war. So we're seeing this shift uh, for political opportunism that ultimately is undermining confidence in the process. And the accountability is really only at the ballot box. So kudos to the American voter for coming out and rejecting the more strident, overt election denialists, but we haven't really seen the the accountability measures show up uh, across those that are, again, kind of election denial adjacent. And if I can add, at the Bipartisan Policy Center, we did a survey looking at who do Americans trust to get their electoral information from. And one of the interesting findings was that they, they trusted that their vote would be counted fine. They didn't trust that it would be counted other votes across the country would be counted fine. And I worry that as Trump does announce and maybe is starting to get, start getting louder and start getting more attention, exactly the concern Chris had is going to help keep reinforcing those things that will then continue into, into 2024. It sounds like what some of you are saying is that we shouldn't get too terrifically optimistic about the fact that nothing happened this time around because these conversations are still taking place, maybe not in the social media channels that some of us might monitor, but in the gabs and in the rumbles and that there's still, there's still a huge segment of the American population that doesn't have confidence in there's the There's a lot of like A-B testing and adaption of narratives and focusing down, I mean, think back to 2020, it was a lot of, hey, Italian satellites and Chinese coming in through the thermostats, and it shifted more to domestic fraud narratives. And now you, it's, again, it's a constant refinement of mes messaging based on experience and seeing what narratives. I mean, this is a real life focus group happening right now. But in, in response, I will say a couple of things that I think that we ought to keep in mind going forward. And one is, of course, no matter how much people retain skepticism about this election, we didn't see any significant acts of violence or disruption occurring at the county stage, which again is positive. Uh, but the second thing is I want to give a little bit of credit to the mainstream media for being careful to uh, manage expectations up front. You know, when I was younger, 
basically the, they all rushed to declare a winner based on exit polls. Now, one thing is, of course, exit polls doesn't, don't work with mail-in voting, but in order to recalibrate the idea that this was gonna be resolved in a day, there was constant messaging about this is gonna take time, this is how we do it. And I think that's an important part of building resistance to some of these more arcane uh, threat narratives. I'm I wondering, think, could, if, I, could I just um, uh, mm -hmm. ch chime in again? It, you know, I do think that when you have somewhere around 30% of the American public who are election, you know, willing to accept election denialism, who believe that somehow the elites control America and they will keep your vote from being counted. That's a problem. It's not a majority. It doesn't mean that they're going to win the 2024 election, but it is a huge problem. I mean, to have 30% of the public so hardcore in these beliefs, it's going to take maybe a generation for some of this to go away. So Michael mentioned the mainstream media and, and as a former political reporter, both on the local and national level, I'm kind of curious what all of you think about the polling data, um, which came out, <laughs> Chris is nodding, yes, yes, yes. Was this in essence, a form of disinformation? Chris, take it. I, I think this is a real question right now is what led to the narratives of the red wave or the red tsunami? And was it, you know, did the, did the pollsters in the party really believe it or were they trying to you know adjust expectations i i, I don't know but this is this, there there has to be a lot of reflection on how badly polling has gone in the last several election cycles and in our you know the the cohorts that are turning out now the 18 to 30 range are they within scope for any of these polls and i think the answer is going to start off with a no and how do you adjust? And is there really any adjustment that 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 you can do? And is there just too much reporting of the polls and and the horse race and not you know, enough digging into the issues? I think that's an important issue. And I think you know part of the problem is uh, there are uh, my observation is there are vast differences in, in the care and precision with which people announce their polling results. You know, you have so I won't mention names, but for example, someone at a, at a, the New York Times who does a very good job of assembling a lot of different polls and average and really analyzing them. Sometimes though, the media publicizes a poll that may come out of a political uh, campaign or maybe someone who's overcorrecting for a mistake last time and the public doesn't know how to distinguish among them. And this is part of a larger problem of, you could say disinformation or misuse of information which is often data is reported, and we've seen this particularly in the public health area, without precision about what the data actually means. Is it correlation? Is it causation? Is it because of an underlying issue that's not being identified that actually results in, a, in something that appears to be linked? So better explanation of the quote, science of the data is important in correcting for the abuse of data by, mis by disinformation. Uh, a reminder to our audience, we do want your questions and comments, so please use the Q&A function, send them to us. Um, we can't talk about um, social media in the election, it doesn't seem to me, without talking about Twitter. Um, Natalie, um, thoughts on the impact of Elon Musk taking over that platform and the, the on-again, off-again verification procedures, et cetera? Well, I think we've walked into the complete unknown because I don't know that Elon Musk has a particular strategy in mind at this point. It, it seems that day to day, uh, Twitter is reacting to itself and to his announcements, to his proposals. It's becoming uh, a platform that becomes less reliable simply because we don't know what tomorrow holds. And when you hear that key people have been released from duty and then maybe rehired, maybe not, you see people with check marks, officials, you have no idea any longer what is truthful, what is not truthful. And I think he's done uh, enormous damage to Twitter, which is unfortunate because Twitter has been an incredibly important political tool in Ukraine, in Iran, in many, many places over time. And I would hate to lose that uh, tool, but if it's gonna become completely unreliable, I think it goes down. Um, Katie, what do you think? Did it have an impact, do you think, on the election? I, I don't think that it had a terrible amount of impact on, on the direct election through election day. Now, the question is, is afterwards, because having folks like Yoel and others 
staying through at least election day. Um, I do believe that when they say many of their content moderation policies hadn't been changed, I do think they saw an influx, right, in the amount of hate speech and people trying to to push the boundaries um, a little bit. For me, the question now is, is after. Um, and I'll be honest, I've been telling people, I don't know how to predict where this week is going to end out um, on so many different things. So I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time trying. But um, I think that one of the things that has struck me recently is that it was only five years ago week that ByteDance bought Musical.ly that turned into TikTok. And TikTok is now one of the places that 18 to 30 year olds are getting most of their news and information. That was only five years ago. And we are now seeing with less people using Facebook, less people using uh, Twitter, we are going to see a massive, I think, shift in, in how people are using the online environment uh, to communicate with one another, to get news and information. Um, that is going to be a real challenge for us as, as we go forward. And again, the less people you have minding the store means that you have more opportunities for bad actors to try to exploit it. And the last people that will be there before Twitter shuts off the lights are going to be the bad actors. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, look, it, there are so many different things going on specifically with Twitter and with TikTok. I mean, look at what happened with Eli Lilly, right? They took a billion dollar haircut off their valuation because somebody spooked an account using a blue check mark. So I'm, I'm a University of Virginia graduate. I was briefly, very briefly on the football team, had family in Charlottesville. Last night at, ele- at about midnight, all the news networks shut down. They were not covering what was happening in Charlottesville Live. Twitter, much like the Boston bomber back in 2011 or so, was one of the few areas or places where you could get up-to-date information. And UVA did a very good job through their emergency management uh, profiles or or handles of of giving out updates, but they weren't verified. And instead, you have other blue tick verified accounts that were pushing out lies, you know, racist stuff. It's so this entire chaotic information environment due to the refactoring of what a blue check mark means. I think that was my biggest concern last week. And I think it continues to manifest in ways, not just around democracy, but public safety, economic and financial in the stock market. And so th- this is something that I think they're gonna really struggle with. And you're seeing it happen in, in, in the, even when the daily average user counts are increasing, the quality of advertisement and the auction, the ad auctions, those top line values are going way, way, way down. So I think like Katie, I mean, it could be that the combination of loss of revenue and the degrading uh, reliability of the infrastructure as they cut 5,000 contractors and 2,500 uh, FTEs, that could lead to kind of an existential issue where drop the data, uh, the servers and the, they can't get back up and running. Um, Linda, I'm wondering if you think that the platforms are doing enough to monitor um, disinformation or potential disinformation in Spanish. Well, um, I don't frankly know the answer to that question, uh, Jean, because despite my name, um, I'm a a 10th generation uh, New Mexican. And so uh, my family's been speaking English a lot, uh, a long time. So I just don't know the answer. Katie, do you happen to know the answer to that one? Is that still a problem? I think it's all a varying degrees of problem. I have a bit of a rant when people ask if the platforms have done do better, because uh, I think there's questions of what does that mean, because um, it could be where they're drawing the policies, but how they are also in terms of enforcing it and the amount of resources and such that they're putting that they're putting towards it. There's always more that they can do. Um, there's always more to do to um, improve the accuracy of those tools to try to find the type of of uh, misinformation faster. Uh, to to try to take it down faster. And so there's no question with that, but there is also no question that at least the big platforms were definitely putting some resources into it. And I'd actually be, I haven't yet seen like how much um, maybe some of that activity moved to, to other platforms, but that'd be something I'll be watching for as we continue to uh, do kind of the postmortems here from the midterms. Um, we do have a question from, excuse me if I, if I, my pronunciation is poor here, but Asan Dimitrov asks, There were many considerations as to the potential impact of a red wave on relations of the US with international partners. Um, Would it be business as usual given what we've seen or are we still going to see some shifts? So a bit of international analysis there, who's comfortable taking that one? 
Well, I'll start. I, I think that you know Ukrainian leadership was watching very carefully because of several of the announcements that have been made in the run-up to the elections by Kevin McCarthy and others in the Republican Party about whether or not uh, the House Republicans will continue to support Ukrainian aid in the way that they have to date. And I think that there's an enormous sigh of relief uh, that the Senate has not turned red in that respect and that they don't have to deal with how much of a reality that might have been. It may have been a pre-election discussion and it may have been real and not having to deal with that, at least at the Senate has been quite a bit of a relief. I, I think that you know other parts of the Republican party have come out very strongly in support, continued support, bipartisan support for Ukrainian. Uh, for, for the Biden administration's Ukrainian policy. And I'm, I'm hopeful that they get a little bit of that work done even this year before the end of the, the term. Um, but I think there is a little bit of a sigh of relief that the unknown doesn't have to be dealt with in as much of an of, of a urgent matter. And I would just add that with respect to China, this is one of the very rare areas where there actually is pretty much consistent bipartisan support for a much more energetic policy in uh, dealing with the China challenge. So I don't think that's going to change at all. Um, I'm wondering about the global impact of, uh, of this election. Um, what do you think foreign um, countries are walking away with here? Um, <coughs> did, uh, did, has the U.S. reclaimed the mantle of the champion of democracy? Or is that a big overstatement? Um, anyone want to grab that? I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a crack at it. Look, I don't think that uh, one election is going to have an, an enormous impact. There was such great damage done in 2020 to America's reputation. It is going to take a while. And I think certainly you're going to have to get through at least another presidential cycle for people to breathe a, uh, a real sigh of relief that everything is well. And as was suggested earlier, I think uh, it is very likely, almost certain, that uh, Donald Trump is going to announce for president again, and you are going to see some of the same kind of nonsense uh, that he has spouted uh, over the years, uh, dominating the airwaves. But you know, there was a question earlier about uh, the media and responsible media. And I said this in 2016, the media, they certainly gave him a pathway to the White House when he was just one of a dozen or so Republican uh, candidates uh, vying for uh, the nomination. He got more attention than everybody else combined. And it was free attention. It was what, you know, is called earned media, but he earned it with lies and with rhetoric that was really offensive. So some of what is gonna happen in 2024, we're gonna start seeing very soon when he makes that announcement and how the press reacts, how much attention they give. Will he again be given uh, free airtime, not just by Fox News, which I think he will, but probably less than in the past. Um, that is gonna be um, important and it's gonna be important in terms of allaying the fears of people around the world uh, about American democracy. The narrative has been that democracy is back on its heels uh, and autocracies have been making progress, but we saw this election here in the US go off so far uh, without major problems. Uh, we saw the election in Brazil. Michael, do you think the narrative has changed? I mean, I agree with Linda. I don't think one swallow a summer makes. I think this is obviously we've avoided what would have been potentially a very damaging outcome in terms of our global standing. Um, I think this is encouraging. Um, I do think what we saw in Brazil also reinforces the idea that autocracy is not somehow got the upper hand. And frankly, look at Iran. You have demonstrations in the street. Um, so we are seeing the, the average citizen also pushing back against autocracy. And it, you know, to me, to have a reasonable but not excessive uh, narrative about what just happened is we ought to remind people that there still is a very powerful impulse for democracy and freedom and human rights among the average citizen. And that while it may sometimes look like people are, you know, are all behind autocracy, that is a gross exaggeration. But this is going to require consistency in messaging 
and in continuing to be engaged and involved in promoting these values. Yeah, and, that's, you know, I'll just add that oh, in, in Ukraine, it's been more than obvious um, that autocracy cannot win when people uh, understand fully what they're giving up. And what we saw this weekend when Kherson in the South was liberated and how people who have hidden their flags underground, dig them up and bring them forward, how they greeted the liberators, how in a town which was six, seven months under occupation, people are willing to come out and speak on behalf of that democracy and that freedom. Today, President Zelensky came to Kherson to the town, stood with his people. I think that Ukraine is providing a perfect example, Iran today, women and, and, and men in Iran, that you know when you are faced with having that freedom taken away, you really understand the value of it and you are willing to stand up and willing to die in order to maintain that democracy. Chris? Jeannie, yeah, I think the, the biggest, the thing I'm struggling the most with, and I think a lot of people are, is kind of the apparent gap between the rhetoric and the results. And what we're seeing is this algorithmic amplification of authoritarian voices to make it seem as if they are in fact on the rise, they're emboldened to continue making the claims and continue pushing, but the results aren't bearing out what they're claiming. And so what is that a factor of? Is it, is it that there are systems in place? Is it social media? Is it the internet? Is it the media? Uh, in general, that's amplifying and giving them room uh, in purchase, or, or is it something else? I think that's what I'm struggling the most with. I see a little bit of it in Brazil uh, as well. And you can look around the globe and it's, it is happening. India is another example, some of the, the spaces in, in Eastern Europe. So what is, what's really behind all of this that I think uh, ideally, hopefully, will come into some degree of clarity in the next couple of years? Katie, do you want to weigh in on the algorithms and what they could be doing here? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's I think it's a combination of 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 everything, right? It's the media environment plus plus social media and it's this question of, you know, when people are clicking or paying attention to this stuff, why are they doing so? Um and and what in that why to Chris's question of why is it then showing up differently at the at the ballot box and everything and the the reason that they're they're doing that um, I think is going to be something that we have to do a lot more um, introspection on. There was an interesting data point though from Facebook that um, Kyle Tharp with the newsletter for what it's worth noticed in that a lot of the far right leaning pages that on Facebook in the past had gotten a lot of reach and engagement actually was getting a lot less during this midterms and we don't. Don't know exactly why and what tweaks, but we do think that maybe it's because some of the tweaks Facebook made to be promoting video um, in the newsfeed and some of those changes Mark had said that they were making and also um, uh, showing less politics. Maybe that was the reason, maybe we don't know exactly why yet. We just know that they were getting less reach and engagement. Um, and um, I think that maybe is also an interesting factor to see how that will play out over the coming years. Uh, we have another question, this from Jonas Pereo Plesner. Uh, could you say more about new electoral laws before 2024 and their significance for election integrity? Linda, you'd mentioned that in one of your answers. Could you expand? Well, the Electoral Count Act actually passed the Senate, uh, but has not been voted yet uh, in the House. And that's why I think it's really important. Uh, it has to be passed by the House during this session of Congress or else it will have to begin all over again. And it was a piece of legislation that had bipartisan support. What it would do would be to make it more difficult to be able to launch a challenge to the counting of uh, the electoral uh, votes from particular states. Under the law as it is now, it takes just one member of Congress, one member of the House of Representatives, and one senator to be able to complain. And that's the debacle that we saw on January 6th, where you had, I think, really disgracefully uh, senators um, like Josh Hawley uh, weighing in and challenging elections, not from their, even from their home states, but other states. And that's when everything fell apart. This would uh, require, the new law would require uh, that there be more uh, members that would actually uh, have to uh, issue a complaint and it would have a higher bar, bar for any of those complaints actually 
uh, having any impact. And that's probably the most significant. Chris may be able to talk more about it. I know he's been very involved in this. Yeah, no, I, I think you nailed it. And also it includes some provisions for uh, clarifying who certifies at the state level and uh, which is traditionally the secretary of state and some states also the governor. And if there's a disagreement, what the litigation opportunities are uh, to clarify who is sending the appropriate slate up to the electoral college. There are a couple other areas that I think uh, are ripe for congressional action. One is the continued investment in America's elections. Uh, you know, states have to run balanced budgets and election administration tends to be one of the first things on the chopping block from an annual legislative appropriations perspective. So to the extent that the federal government can be a stopgap and provide consistent funding to the states, I think that's, that's a good place to start. But I would not necessarily use the traditional um, uh, distribution mechanism, which is based on the prior census that gives kind of a peanut butter approach uh, based on uh, population. I would also take a risk-based approach and I would have uh, a prioritization for retiring any of those direct recording equipment machines that are only touch screen and removable media. I would want us to get to as close to 100% paper ballots, voter verifiable paper trail for uh, American elections. I would also encourage uh, the uh, post-election audits, post-election pre-certification audits. At this point, 43 states plus the District of Columbia have some kind of election audit. I'd like to see a little bit more standardization, but also uh, across the board, 50, per, 50 states plus DC have, um, have audits as much as possible. Chris, I remember a few years ago when you were head of CISA, there was there was real concern about the quality of election equipment in some states. Um, investment has been made in some places. What's the state of play right now? Would you say that there's been significant improvement or there still is a lot to be done? Well, uh, so 2016 was just under 80 percent of ballots cast had a paper record associated with them. Uh, in the intervening period from 2016 to 2020, that number went up to about 95%. Some of that was due to investment and retiring of those legacy machines. That was South Carolina, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and elsewhere um, that went from those touch screens to something that spits out a piece of paper. That's a great, great, great thing. But you still have states like Louisiana and New Jersey that, uh, that have those touch screen machines. But also covid changed how elections happen and really expanded uh, the availability of absentee balloting and, and universal or mail balloting. The one last thing I would I'd point out here is that I would not expect, despite the narrative and the rhetoric coming out of House about election day, not election week, that would be absolutely disastrous to Republican electoral outcomes because of the get out the vote and the mobilize the vote uh, uh, strategies they've, they've had over the last 10 years. I think Trump's efforts against mail-in have already affected those to a certain extent, but the GOP relies heavily on mail-in voting, particularly in places like Florida. And I just can't see them changing or passing any laws that would you know, effectively kneecap themselves. Gene, let me add one other thing in response to Jonas's question. There's something to watch on the, not really legislative front, but on the legal front. Uh, there's a case going up to the Supreme Court now on the independent state legislature doctrine. That doctrine is based on a provision in the U.S. Constitution that says the times, places, and manner of holding elections shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. Now, the question that has arisen is what happens if the legislature says the way we're going to tabulate votes is not based on counting machine votes or mail-in votes, but only on votes for people who satisfy a very narrow kind of voting, which can be sculpted in a way that would favor one party or another. Now, our immediate reaction is that would be unfair. And when there have been efforts by legislatures and states to do something to kind of put a thumb on the scales, the state Supreme Courts have said, no, that violates the state constitution and they've invalidated it. The argument that's going to be in the court is the proponents, and they tried to do this in 2020, argue the state Supreme Court and the state constitution has no role to play. The legislature is free to do whatever it wants to determine how votes are counted and how elections are certified. If that were to prevail, 
that would remove what has proven to be a significant barrier against manipulating the process on the part of uh, you know legislatures that are strongly tipped, let's say, in favor of the Republican Party. We have a couple of other questions. Olafa asks, um, Katie highlighted the important observation that the social network landscape has diversified in the last year with so-called alt platforms on the fringes now having their own marketplace. Um, how can governments, tech industry, and civil society together build a firewall to stop more people being sucked up by the rabbit holes, uh, AKA the alt platforms? Nobody seems to return from those dark places. Are there any concrete ideas, Katie? Well, I think one is going to be, I mean, I would like to see more legislation around transparency. I'll be curious to see how, as the DSA Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act starts to get enacted in Europe, um, that has some of that that will happen because we need to have a better understanding of how these things happen across all of these different platforms to even understand the the fully understand the problem and to think about the the solutions um, around some of this. I will say too that I'm hopeful that you know, there are a lot of really talented people who have been laid off in the last couple of weeks. And I would really, really hope that the government start to try to snatch some of those people up and actually get folks inside the governments and in regulators who really understand how these platforms work, understand the questions to be asking them, understand that the types of ways of the design changes and other things that you might be able to do um, to actually have impact on this across the way. I would also like to see legislation around political ads. I know the FEC is, is considering on Thursday um, looking at updates to the types of disclaimers that are required. But again, we're seeing advertising move to platforms that are not doing the self-regulatory measures of having ad transparency tools. And so we need to mandate that um, across the board so that we can have a better sense of what's happening. Otherwise, there's a very distinct chance that in 2024, we have another set of surprises that we never saw coming because we didn't have transparency into these systems in the same way that we didn't have that in 2016. Chris, I'm curious your reaction. Um, Katie makes a suggestion that with all these layoffs in the tech sector, tech sector, the government could finally address that workforce issue that we've heard about over and over and over again. Is that realistic? I, I, look, I think it's certainly an option. I, I will tell you as, uh, and I'm sure Secretary Chertoff can uh, relate, but as a consulting firm trying to hire away from these larger technology firms that have you know restricted stock units and grants, uh, that's, a, that's a tough barrier uh, when you're competing for talent. So perhaps the, the market's a little bit uh, more stable, but there are still real significant barriers to hiring into the United States government. And that includes some of the classified or clearance-based positions. So I expect what you'll see is that there will be a broader private sector effort to hire them, even though I did see that Amazon's going to lay off about 10,000 employees uh, in the coming weeks. I think also that there'll be think tanks, there'll be universities that'll be looking. So I think there'll be other opportunities out there, uh, but it is not a bad idea where agencies like CISA that have probably an open <coughs> you know, FTEs of about 800 positions to come in and, and give a leg up because it was not just the moderation teams, the trust and safety teams, they're also information security and technology jobs. One thing I'd add though that Katie uh, mentioned, I think that, that was also mentioned earlier is that Look, there was some reporting last week about how the United Arab Emirates has been using their own influence in money through lobbying in K Street and elsewhere in Washington, D.C. over the last several years. And, and that's just one country. And if you think that, the, that it's just the UAE, I, I mean, I got a bridge somewhere to sell you. I guarantee you, as I mentioned earlier, the Chinese are doing the exact same thing in the United States, in Washington, D.C., to influence policy decisions and policymakers and legislators uh, that, that there's a lot more to come out, I think, on those stories. Um, we have a question here. What role can digital media literacy play in this effort? What measures and investments are needed? Linda, do you want to try that one? Well, I think that um, one of the big problems, and it alludes back to the uh, question you just asked, is that there's a, a very wide spectrum of digital literacy in this country. And the most the people who are the most literate tend to be young people. Uh, they may get their politics uh, from sources or their news, at least from sources like TikTok. 
Uh, but then there are, you know, people my age and, and that of some of the others on, on the panel um, who still rely on newspapers and still rely on, you know, the networks. Uh, and certainly, uh, I, I think that the, the challenge is to try and ensure that there are enough voices out there, enough uh, organizations such as this one and some of those like uh, my own um, RDI that are working to educate people uh, about how to get information, what information is to be trusted. And some of that has got to just be done by grassroots efforts, uh, some by advertising, but it's not something where you can have a uh, a plan that is going to fix it all because there is just too broad a range of, of, of skills uh, within our population on this issue. And a long-term solution. Um, uh, Olaf has another question here. What actually went wrong with the disinformation governance board, which seemed to be one government idea to coordinate reaction to disinformation? Clearly branding was part of the problem, but what else was at play? Michael, do you want to weigh in on that? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, th I think the real issue was, I mean, the idea of coordinating and making sure that the response to disinformation operates within the legal rules and the guardrails and in a way that's sensible, uh, you can't really argue against that. That makes perfect sense. I think one problem was the branding issue. The word governance and the suggestion, this means the government is going to control information particularly in the current environment, was a very, very um, uh, un unfortunate notion. And it's one that fed the idea this is the government trying to be the censor. Um, so but I think by eliminating that, you eliminated what was probably a somewhat superfluous bureaucratic level of review. And the recommendation the Homeland Security Advisory Council made was simply to take the important functions of coordination and making sure the rules are being followed and lodge those in the existing institutions, general counsel's office, the privacy office, uh, you know, the intelligence and analysis uh, uh, section. And you can achieve the same result without creating a level of bureaucracy in what appears to be perhaps an overly intrusive government role in managing information. I'd, I would add here, and I would, was not involved in either the stand-up or the, the recommendations that Secretary Chertoff just mentioned, but I'll tell you one thing, based on my time uh, in government, I'm sure Secretary, I, I think you would agree with this, is you never roll anything out without briefing the Hill and getting their feedback and how you may need to adjust your concept or just spike the whole thing right out the gate. As Secretary Chiltoff mentioned, everything they were doing is had been pre-existing for years and years and years. And in fact, from a good government perspective, I would want some sort of effort to streamline, consolidate, and ensure consistency of civil liberties and uh, civil rights oversight, which is, I think, in primarily what the, uh, I think a lot of this was probably just in the execution, but uh, you know, once the bell was rung and the Ministry of Truth narratives were established, uh, there was really no good uh, all, all, you know, path forward. Um, we're, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I wanna try and look ahead believe it or not, just another two years till the next election. I'm, I'd like to hear all of your thoughts on what new threats you think could emerge uh, in that time period. And also, uh, what are some of the important things that should be done between now and then to strengthen the integrity of U.S. elections? Natalie, why don't I start with you on that? Well, I'll just add that I think what we need to focus on is building trust, rebuilding trust in our political institutions at every level. And so I think that it behooves our government, our school, our education system, our media. If we don't start to provide the information that helps to rebuild that trust, then we will continue to be at enormous risk, whether it's to foreign players or domestic. And so I think trust in our institutions is critical over the next two years. Linda, your thoughts? Uh, trust is absolutely critical, and I think it is going to take work um, by nonprofit organizations, uh, by the public service community, to try to educate people, to get them to understand our system. And American schools need to do a better job in educating American students uh, about civics and their responsibilities as citizens. Uh, Michael, some things to keep our eye on and some things to do. 
Well, I agree with what, what uh, uh, Linda and Natalie said. I agree also with Chris that we ought to make sure we are correcting any issues and the actual IT structure we're relying upon in voting. And I think, again, uh, transparency ought to be something that we are pushing for in the platforms in terms of the algorithms and in terms of the identity of people who are posting. And whether that's a matter of law or whether it's a matter of uh, advertisers pressing the platforms on this, I think that transparency is an important element of trust. Katie, to-do list? So for me, I'm looking at the number of elections happening in 2024, because it's the first time ever that we'll not only have the US presidential, but in the same year, we will also have elections in India, Indonesia, Ukraine, Taiwan, Mexico, the United Kingdom, and the European Parliament, all in the same year, plus many others. And that's never happened before. That's a lot of fronts uh, for people to be trying to protect the integrity of elections online. That's a lot of places um, to be looking at how um, various, whether it's foreign agents, people just trying to sell fake news uh, to get clicks and what they're trying to do and how that all interacts with one another. And so we need to start preparing now to be looking at how all of these elections globally will play off of one another and make sure that we have the resources built up now um, so that we are ready for when, I mean, 2023 starts or 2024 starts this week um, with, with, with President, with Trump's announcement. Um, and so we need to, um, I, I just very worry that we're going to come out of the midterm thinking and Brazil thinking that we are out of the woods and I don't think that we are I think that we are going to go deeper into them and Katie just to follow up who has to make that investment I think the tech companies need to make that investment governors governments and regulators need to make that investment nonprofits need to make that investment media does as well as academia we need all the different sectors to be playing their part and their role in in working on these different types of issues because if it's only one or a few of them doing so um, we leave a lot of um, a lot of things on the table that we could potentially do Chris leaders have to lead leaders have to lead we have to make the shift from What's the harm in humoring him to this is unacceptable in a democracy? And I, my hope is that Trump's uh, vulnerability over the last couple of weeks will empower and enable and embolden leaders to be more outspoken rather than just maybe not investing in that race, actually stepping up and saying like, you know what, this is not acceptable behavior. We're, we're, not, we're not with you. And we have to leave it there. My thanks to all of you, Linda Chavez, Chris Krebs, Katie Harbath, Natalie Juresco, and Michael Chertoff for joining us here today. And thank you also to, your, to the audience for your great observations and questions. Uh, a lot more to come. We will keep our eye on it and I'm sure hold other events to discuss things. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.